Good uh, afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to run a webinar about uh, Zenroom. The first part is introductory, so it's going to be a little bit theoretical. I'm going to show you what Zenroom is about. And then following up, uh, we'll show some uh, hands-on uh, scripting, and we're going to get a little bit into details about what Zenroom can do. So when we land on the zenroom.org page, first thing we read is crypto smart contract executor. Uh, it took us a while to get to this punchline. Initially, it was crypto VM because Zenroom brings online, or I mean, it brings in memory a virtual machine. Uh, the thing is, whenever you say virtual machine, people first think of virtual box. And so people used to get very confused. Uh, it, the kind of virtual machine that Zenroom brings online is more like the Java virtual machine or the JavaScript virtual machine in that sense. Let's get straight to specs. First and most important thing is that Zenroom is written in C, which makes it its payload very, very tiny and the use of RAM very optimized. But also we have uh, build scripts to have it uh, running on Linux, Windows, Mac, as a command line application, as well as Android and iOS as a library, and also WebAssembly, so WASM, which is something that is becoming increasingly useful. I mean, more we're getting used, we're getting using, using this more and more um, every day. Uh, who is familiar with WebAssembly, guys? You can, uh, no, no one knows what WebAssembly is? Okay. So uh, oh, WebAssembly yeah. is uh, a tool chain to transcompile C code into a bytecode that is executed in a virtual machine running in the browser, pretty much like the JavaScript virtual machines, uh, V8 and uh, whatever the other one's called. That, uh, that execute the JavaScript in your browser. So basically WebAssembly is uh, quickly becoming a new standard for web development. And uh, uh, based on our tests, some cryptographical oper operations on in for the build of Zenroom in uh, WebAssembly are as fast as the C, uh, as the code build compile in native C. So in, in a native uh, um, binary. So yeah, so basically you, you can run stuff in the browser nearly as fast as you can run a compile application. And I'm gonna show you in the hands-on uh, uh, test we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you quickly a couple of scripts uh, using Zenroom as a command line, but most of it is gonna be uh, using a web-based version of, uh, of Zenroom. Okay, so this is the tech part. What can Zenroom do? It can do mostly cryptography. And uh, when we think of cryptography, we can think of traditional cryptography. So asymmetric cryptography, which means ECDH and ECDSA, as well as symmetric cryptography, which is AES GCM. Zenroom can also do several, it has several uh, hashing algorithms uh, from basic hashing to password based hashing to uh, yeah, there are several uh, ways, several possibilities to hash different things, uh, as well as uh, has built in more modern, or if you, if you want more advanced cryptography, like zero knowledge proofs and attribute based credentials based on the paper uh, re, uh, published by UCL last year named Coconut. Uh, which is being used right now by Facebook for their uh, upcoming Libra cryptocurrency. So basically UCL developed a, um, a well, released a paper on cryptography that uh, Facebook kind of bought. So Facebook bought a startup that uh, was built around this, uh, uh, this crypto flow. And uh, since we were working together in the same project last year, we had the chance to, to develop, well, to implement in Zenroom the most of the cryptographic flows is in the paper. And we're gonna look into that in a minute. Uh, very important, 
we've done a lot of work on determinism. What does determinism mean in cryptography? Determinism means that uh, given the same data, uh, we can guarantee that uh, given the same data and the same uh, algorithm or the same scripts, the output will be consistently the same across platforms. Uh, these, this means, for example, that if you want to generate a key pair from a known seed, it doesn't matter if you run it on a Linux server or on an iOS phone, the generation of the key pair will, pro will produce the same output, which is a key uh, factor in blockchains because when you run a smart contract, you, you have to make sure that wherever you run it, the smart contract has to give the same output in order to trigger the consensus algorithm. So what we can do is that uh, if we, we can out blockchain, well, smart, uh, Zendrum can execute smart contracts for blockchains running on different kinds of platforms where one of them is an AMD Linux server, one is a Windows server, and another one is uh, a Raspberry Pi. So an ARM-based Linux box. Okay. Uh, last thing, uh, which is what we're going to focus more on today, uh, we have developed a domain-specific language, DSL, which is non-Turing complete, and it feels like a natural English language. So we didn't want to use the, the term uh, natural, natural English, natural language, because uh, this scripting language although it reads and writes like English, has a very, uh, a very fixed or very strict syntax. So you can read the scripts, but if you want to write them, you have to know exactly what the statement is. Uh, in order to help this, we have developed an, uh, a little uh, the IDE, a little uh, development environment with autocomplete that I'm going to show you in a minute. And uh, this, uh, this DSL, this domain-specific language is called Zencode. And it is based on, so the syntax is based on BDD, behavioral driven development. So within, within the, the language, you will see that the, the execution is divided in three phases, the given, the when, and the then phase. And the security is based on LangSec. Uh, our founder, Jeremy, is a big fan of LangSec. All right, so those were the features. Let's scroll down quickly, just to show you what you can find on the page. So here you find a link to the documentation. The documentation contains my computer is horribly slow because of uh, Zoom, obviously. In the documentation, you have uh, a quick start that shows you a very simple script and uh, leads you to, to execute it. Then there, is, there are specifications uh, for the more, most generic statements for the three phases. So for example, here there is a, uh, you, you, are, you are explained how to load strings, how to load uh, complex objects like arrays, dictionaries and schemas. Um, and uh, how, to, how to load objects from a JSON file. Uh, very, very briefly, we're going to look into this in a minute. Uh, you can load, so in order to load an array, you need to define what kind of array it is. Uh, here we go. So each, basically you don't have such a thing as a generic array. You have uh, for every type, you have a different kind of array. So in order to load it, you define that it's an hex array or a string array or a number array or, or a base 64. And then you can in Zenroom load data from JSON. And you can have a flat JSON like this one where you have a number, a string, and an array, as well as a nested JSON, but you can only have one level of nesting right now. Where, so this is, this, is at, uh, this is the root. So all this thing is at root level. And here you have a one level of nesting with some other stuff inside. 
If you want to load something that is in the second level of nesting, you load it like this. Given that I have a string name, the second string inside the second object. All right. So this was, this was a quick overview of the given statement. In the when statement, statement uh, is the largest uh, state, well, is largest phase that we have because in the given statement, you load all the data and you set all the variables that you will need uh, to perform the computation. In the when statement, this is where the computation occurs. So I have grouped the, all the statements in, um, together based on, uh, on the functions of the statements. So here we have a group for manipulation where we can do sum and subtract of numbers, append, rename, insert into an array, remove from an array, split, and here, very important, flatten an array into a string. Uh, why, why is this important? Because if you want to, to create the hash, well, if you want to hash an array uh, in Zenroom, first you need to flatten, the, to flatten the array into a string, and then you can hash a string. Uh, the same thing if you want to use another complex object called dictionary. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, many people have been asking how to flat, how to hash arrays and Zendroom and this is the solution. Uh, so here you have uh, examples of all the statements with comments. Uh, everything I'm talking about now is searchable. So for example, if I want to search for flat 10, it's gonna bring me right here. Here we go. Okay. The second group is create regular, regular or random objects. This is mostly random objects actually. So if I want to create a certain object of, of a certain size, I do it here. Or I can, I can create a variable and assign it a value as a type. When I set my newly created string to call me the Pink Panther as string, or when I set my newly created base64 to this value as base64. All right. If we scroll below, we have cryptography, basic cryptography. So basic hashing, this is, uh, this is something you probably won't ever need to do manually. Uh, we'd see it just in case. K derivation function, password based case key derivation function. So this is basically a hashing with a uh, with salt. Uh, one even more advanced type of hashing called HMAC. And uh, also this is something you probably don't need to do manually. All right. The last group is comparisons. So you can compare, for example, if a string is equal to another one, if a number is less or equal than another one. And if uh, a string, if the content of a string is found into an array or not found into an array. Good. Then we have, uh, after this, we have the then phase. Uh, the, in, the then phase is where you uh, print out the output, where you format and print out the output. Uh, this is a, uh, not much happening here, it's quite boring. But basically, if you have, if you store a number like this, when you print it out, you do it like this, and it gets printed in its default, uh, well, in its uh, predefined uh, type. If you want to change a type, you can do then print my number as hex, and then instead of, instead of printing this, it prints this, which is the, yeah, that's the X value of, of this number probably. Yeah, then there are some more details, but uh, good. If we scroll down in, in the dictionary, we have Zencode Advanced. Uh, here we have scenarios. What is a scenario? A scenario is an internal library of Zenroom that contains a set of statements grouped together because of a certain function. So here we have the scenarios that we have, scenarios that we, are, that we have are credentials, ECDH, petition, the P3T. So credential contains uh, the, zero, the whole zero knowledge proof cryptographic flow. 
So this is gonna this, this can be useful for you for those of you who want to use Zenroom on a blockchain or uh, want to work with uh, SSI self sovereign identities. Well, in any situation when you wanna where you wanna use a credential, ECDH is uh, stands for ellip elliptic curve Diffie Hellman and is a it contains all the stuff you need to do asym asymmetric encryption or signing. Uh, the petition scenario, uh, probably none of you will need it, but the petition scenario uh, is a cryptographic flow to vote digitally where the vote is generated cryptographically and it cannot be messed with uh, later on. And it's already blockchain, uh, blockchain ready. DP3T is the Corona proximity tracing algorithm that is used in uh, all, it's the official European Commission Corona tracking algorithm. Okay. This was the manual. If you scroll down, there are uh, bindings, uh, examples of, on how to use Zenroom in Node in the browser in React. Somewhere below here, we have a React native uh, example as, as well. Then we have some extensions that we'll look at later. This one, we added it yesterday. It's a Telegram uh, bot that does two things, encrypt and decrypt, and it's actually running now. And this is the code. It uses API room, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay, enough of going through the through the boring manual. So this was the manual. The sandbox is what we're going to play with most of the time. So I'm going to open it now. I'm going to scroll down a little bit further through downloads. So here we have Linux, Win, Win Mac command line interface, Linux for X X64 and ARM. So X64 works for Ubuntu for, for your laptop and ARM can, works on the Raspberry Pi. Then we have Windows uh, and we have a Mac OS X64 command line, uh, command line interface application. Libraries for Android and iOS for all the CPUs that you will ever need. A little bit below we have uh, JavaScript. So in reality, uh, this is a half a lie because we have an NPM package, but inside the NPM package, we have the WASM, uh, we have Zenroom compiling WASM surrounded by a, a wrapper written JavaScript. And this is super easy to use and very well documented. We have a lot of examples. So to any of you thinking of using Node or using uh, Zenroom in a browser, uh, this should be a pretty good starting point. Uh, we have bindings for uh, Python as well. And we also have something for Golang, even though um, I can't promise this is, uh, this is updated. All right, we scroll below, we have uh, a few extensions that we wrote. Uh, today, we're gonna show you how this works. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. One more word about the downloads. Uh, all those downloads are technically nightly builds uh, written by our, uh, built by our CI. But consider that every time Xenon is built, there is a long list of testing scripts that is run. And if a script fails, then, then the build fails too. So they, it's true that they are nightly builds, but they are, they basically every comment, both in Lua and in Zen code that uh, Xenon should execute is tested in the scripts. So they, they should be pretty stable. Good. We went on for, we started 20 minutes ago. Uh, let, let's take a little break to ask if there are questions. No questions? Or everybody falling asleep already? No questions so far from me. <laughs> okay, cool. No question, thank you. No questions? For me, no. Okay. Let me show you quickly what Zenroom is about for those of you who haven't seen it yet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use a command line version of Zenroom uh, on a uh, on a Linux uh, 
X64 based box and I'm going to do also the same thing on a Raspberry Pi. Just so that you see the difference. All right, this is the Linux box. Let me make it a little bit bigger, but well, it's easy to read. All right, cool. Uh, so we are into, let me, let me check this out. Uh, D Zen code misc. Okay. So the most simple uh, script we can run, well, one of the most simple scripts you can run in Zen room. What happened? Oh. I pressed something randomly. Yeah. The mo one of the most simple script you can run is the key pair generator. The way you run the way you run it is the following: Zen room minus Z. Uh, Peter asked the question if we can explain the connection between Zen room and Decode OS. So the connection between Zen room and Decode OS is the same as uh, an apple and the sun. They are both round, but they have nothing to do with each other. So this will be for a different uh, for a different session, or we we'll take it later on later offline. Okay, how do you run Xenrom as a command line? The the most simple thing you can do is just running a script. Oh, let me show the script first. Nano key pair dot zen. So this script generates a key pair. We start from setting the, uh, the scenario, which is going to be ECDH. It could also be credentials. You can also generate a, a key pair with a credential scenario. Uh, very important, keep in mind that you can load two scenarios at the same time. It's going to take uh, more space in the RAM, but uh, it won't hurt. Uh, it won't hurt. So if you are unsure, just load all the scenarios and you see what works and what doesn't. Then this is the real script. You have three statements. One is a given statement. The next is a when statement. The third is a then statement. The given statement sets a variable. Uh, it tells Zenroom who is uh, the person uh, or who is the entity running the script. In this case, it's Andrea. In the, when, in the when statement, the computation happens and the computation is creating the keeper. Now creating the keeper means generating a random number uh, which will end up as uh, the private key. Then you take the private key and you do, I believe you do a, a, a hash to point using ECP, but I might be wrong. Anyway, you take the random, the random uh, makes the random turns into the private key. Then you, you do some, some more magic and based on that, you generate the, private, the public key. After this, you print the data. What happens here is that this private key and public key are uh, packed together in a nice JSON file, okay? So I'm gonna run the script by doing zenru minus z key pair dot zen, all right? Here we go. Everything worked fine. Zen room used 400 Ks of RAM and it produced this key pair, which is very hard to read like this. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run this again and use JQ to make it look prettier. So JQ is a JSON prettifier. Here we go. Now you can read a little bit better. Uh, some of you will ask, what is the equal at the end of every string that, gener that Zenroom generates. The equal is a sign that the encoding is base 64. So basically everything that Zenroom produces that is not a string, well, everything that every cryptographical object produced by Zenroom will end up with, a, with an equal, which means this is encoded in base 64. All right, this is the keeper I am generating and I'm gonna do, Something else, I'm gonna show you how fast this can happen. So I'm gonna do time. 
Yeah, so the whole thing happened in 23, 0, 0, 0.0, 0, so 23 milliseconds. If I run it again, 19 milliseconds, 21 milliseconds. Let me do the same thing here on the Raspberry Pi, just so that you, you, you believe that this is really multi-platform. Uh, what do we have here? CD desktop, less keygen.z, right. Let me check the script. Let me see if it's the same. Here we go. Scenario is CDH, create the keeper. Given that I'm known as Alice, when I create the keeper, then print my data. Then I do zen room minus z keygen.zen jq. Here we go. Ha, huh, something funny happened with the memory. I don't know why. Let me try again. Ah. Huh. Interesting. This is this is very new. It wasn't here last time. I don't know if it's because of JQ. Let me see. Yeah, it is because of JQ. So JQ is screwing up the output. JQ dot. Yeah, I have no idea. Anyway, so this is the output of Zenroom. It's given here. The this this part should be down here, but JQ messes with it. Uh, I'm gonna do the same exercise and show you how long it takes on the Raspberry Pi. And you see that it takes a little bit longer, but so this is a key gen with, with a hash. So it's, uh, it, 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 there is some calculation going on here. All right, good. Um, furthermore, if you want, so obviously some uh, smart contracts, some scripts will need to have input. Uh, let me see if I find something interesting here. Uh, CD. Yeah. I'm not even that sure this is going to work. No, no. Zen code dot zen. Okay, yeah. All right, let's give it a try. Uh, I, I'm not sure this is gonna work because I haven't uh, run this in a long time. But anyway, when you're using Zenroom as a common line, you can pass it one, one script in Zen code and two parameters containing data. The data has to be formatted in JSON or in Seaboard. And the way you pass them those two parameters are, is, is this Zenroom minus Z, Zen code Zen minus A, keys dot uh, data dot json doesn't make a difference anyway but a minus a stands for all and minus key minus key stands, stands for keys uh, it doesn't make any difference internally so you can pass keys with minus a and the other way around but uh, for good sake order i'm going to show it to you like this let's run this let's see what happens okay this is a, that's an older version forget about this i'm going to show you the same the same example uh, in the online tool. Right. So this was Zenroom as a common line. Let's look at the, the online playground, which is, uh, which is a, little, it's a little bit more than an online playground. Um, to be fair, let me show it to you how it will look for you when you first, when you first, uh, Run it yourself. All right, whatever. Good. So the first thing that we see are the examples. And here I am going to generate a keeper using exactly the same script that you've seen before, which is this one. So scenario is the age, create the keeper, given that I'm known as Alice. When I create the keeper, then print my data. How do I run it? I press this, boom. And I get my keeper here. Here it takes 109 milliseconds because there is a, there is React Native, uh, sorry, not React Native, there is React JS uh, work in the background that makes everything much slower. But the keeper is exactly the same. Here we have uh, the feedback of Zenroom. And if we make, if we make a mistake, like let's say for example, when blah, Blah. Zenroom is going to complain saying 
Zen code pattern not found when blah blah. So whenever you do we do you do an error some something uh, the Zen room will uh, will uh, write it and will explain you in the output what went wrong. What I want to show you here as well is that within this editor we have built in an autocomplete feature that works pretty nicely because you start typing when and then you can scroll with your keys and you have a list of all the statements of um, of of Zen room with all the scenarios that should all be updated and work fine. Let me give you let me give you an example here, very simple. When I create an array of 13 random objects of 256 bits, when I am on the line I want, I just press enter and it goes into here. I'm gonna do eight random numbers of 512 bits. And then I press play. Here we go. My array, of the eight random objects and my keeper. Um, keep in mind that whenever you have a when statement with the word create followed by the, the output of the statement is gonna be an object named like the word next to the. So when I create the keeper, it's, wanna out, it's gonna output something called keeper. When I create the array, it's gonna create something named array. Here you see array inside on top of keeper because the output has already been uh, uh, been sorted alphabetically. So uh, Zenroom it sorts everything alphabetically by default, and there is no way out. But what I can do is, if I don't want this to be called array, I can rename it, and I can do when I rename the name of simple object to name of new object. So I want to rename the array. to we love Corona virus, for example. And then I'm gonna press play again, and I will see that the R is called like this. So that was a very simple live coding example of how to use this. Right, going on, I can show you some more examples. Uh, generate the random cryptographic object, we just, we just saw this. Let's look, let's look at simple encryption. So, uh, so-called AES-GCM, as far as I understand. And let's, let's look at the script. Given that I have a string named password here in keys, the password is my very secret password. Given that I have a string named header down here, a very important secret, Given that I have a string named message, which is here, and here we start with the computation. When I encrypt the secret message, message with password, then print the secret message. If I press play, I'm gonna get the secret message encrypted. This is a typical uh, AES GCM output with uh, where this is encrypted. This is a checksum. The header is not encrypted. The header is simply base is simply converted to base64. And I can prove it to you if you don't believe me. And if IV stands for internal vector, which is part of the algorithm. Um, what did I want to show you here when I encrypt? Uh, then print a secret message. Well, okay, let me let me show you that the header in reality is a base 64 is a base 64 version of this okay so then print the he header as string here we go so you see that here i'm printing the header outside from the secret message as a string. If I don't want to print it as a string, I'm just print it, the, it, as, it, as, it's, it, it as, it's, as its default uh, encoding is, we will see that the header will, be, will look the same as this. No, I'm lying. So inside here is base64, 
here comes out as a string, it doesn't matter. Let's do it the other way around. Then print the header as base64. Now they should look the same. Here we go. QSB to Z, QSB to Z, X, Z, X, Q equal, Z, X, Q equal. Good. So this was symmetric encryption uh, with a password. Uh, we have, uh, let's go quickly to, this, to the symmetric decryption. So decrypt a message using a password. It is, uh, so basically, well, this was the output of the previous script. We find it here as input of the script and the script goes like, given that I have a valid secret message, given that I have a string named password here, when I decrypt the text of secret message with password, here I rename it uh, just for, for fun, but this is not necessary. Then print the text decrypted as string. So I run this and I get the, the text uh, decrypted as before. And again, for fun, then print the header. No, didn't work because you couldn't find the header. Uh, then print the header. I think that I have to do then print the header inside inside the secret message. Let me see. Yeah, now it works. Can I make a question about this, Andrea, or sure. I need to wait? Um, there is, is, is there any limitation about the length of the message that we can encrypt? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, instead of answering, I am going to show you something we did in the documentation. Uh, in the scenario ECDH, because of a use case that uh, we've been asked to work on, we uh, generate key pair, encrypt adjacent with a public key. So in order, uh, right now, uh, we, right now, in order to encrypt a, a large, uh, data sets or where a data set that is saved in whatever you want to save it, JSON or whatever you like, you have, you first have to convert it to base 64. Okay. So I made an example on, on how to do this. So given you have a JSON file, uh, you want to encrypt it and then decrypt it using Xamarin. And because of this, we're taking, we're just taking a, uh, a, a JSON file and convert it to base64 using this application, which is a, a, a Linux uh, program that can be installed. And the output is this, but actually I believe that I can show you how this runs. So you, you're still seeing, seeing my screen, right? All right, CD Zen room, LS, CD test, CD, what's it called? CD Zen code cookbook. Those are all the tests that I wrote. Well, there are some of the tests that, that I wrote. And or LS, you have a bunch of tests called some, called run something. Here I'm looking for, run scenario ecdh encrypt.json. Let me show the script to you. Now no, run scenario ecdh encrypt. So here what happens is that uh, we take a very long, yeah, very long JSON file that I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. And we encrypt it to base64. Then we save it into uh, using a cut, we save it into this file and then we save it, yeah, we save it into this file and we pass this file to Zen room uh, as, a, as a, as a, as a, sorry. We convert the JSON file into this B64 and then we do cats of this JSON file 
uh, of this base64 into a JSON file with a, a uh, formatting that Zenroom likes. And then below, we take this JSON file in base64 and we encrypt it. Let me see if this is true. Yeah, given that I have a base64 name, name JSON, JSON file in base64 and we encrypt this, which is a very long string. And I'm going to show this to you in a second. Run scenario ccdh encrypt json.sh. So this is the this is the the JSON file uh, that has been decrypted. As you see, it's pretty it's pretty large. I don't know, it's like maybe 10, 10, 5 case or something. This is the decrypted JSON file as base sixty four, and this is the encrypted JSON file. So um, I think that Zenroom has a buffer limit allocation of a meg one megabyte, but that is, that is defined in the header. So if you need to encrypt something bigger, then we can work something out. Am I answering? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. All right, cool. So we were actually here. We're, I, was, I was using the, the incognito, the incognito window. I'm going to show to you. I'm going to show you in, in a second uh, why. This was the crypt message with the password. Here we have encrypt a message using asymmetric cryptography. The difference is that instead of, instead of using a password, we're going to use a key pair and public keys. So let's look at the script. This is a little bit uh, a little bit longer because you need to declare who you are, you need to load your keeper, and then here we are encrypting the same message for two public keys. So you need to load those two public keys. And here we do the cryptography. When I encrypt the secret message of message for Bob, and I'm also renaming it to, to make it look prettier. And then I'm printing the, the secret for Bob and secret for card. So this is my keeper. Those are the public keys of Bob and Carl, and this is the message. All right, when I run this, I see that I have two encrypted uh, objects where, where the first one is encrypted with this public key, while this one is encrypted with this public key. And in the next example, which is decrypt, a message, we take the output generated here. So we take exactly this message. Now, uh, don't mind that uh, check zoom IV and text don't matter, that don't match, because uh, whenever you do use this cryptography, there is always a random seed uh, included. So if I run this again, uh, check zoom IV and text will look different. Anyway. We take this output and we use the public key of the one that encrypted it, so that is. So here I am declaring that I am Bob. So Bob is, is the one of the two people that received the encrypted message. So I say, that given, that I am, given that I am known as Bob or given that, that I am Bob, it's the same thing. You can also do like this. Given I have my key pair, which is here, so before we only had the public key of Bob, now we have the whole keeper. Given that I have a public key from Alice, given I have a secret message named secret for Bob, so I'm only gonna load this because that's the only one I can decrypt. When I decrypt the text and I rename it, then print the text for Bob and also print the header. The header we don't want, we don't want to print today. So we're just gonna print the, the secret message. I'm gonna press play to run the script and that's what you get. So this is the decrypted message. All right, I guess everything is clear until now. So when you, well, I'm gonna show you how to, how to hash an array. So here we have a nice, a nice array with the, the emails for the full Beatles. And this, the, there is no scenario here, as you can see, because we don't need it. 
I, here I'm loading the string array. So given I have a, str a string array named my array to be hashed, which is this, when I create the flattening of my array to be hashed and I rename it again to something that looks nicer. And then when I create the hash of my flattened array using this, uh, this algorithm, right now we can use SHA 512, 500, so sorry. Yes, SHA 512 or SHA 256. And I rename it again. And then I print, first I print the flattened array and then I print the hashed array, uh, just to share the difference. When I press play, I get this. This is my flattened array. So basically this thing as a, um, as a base 64 string and then my hashed array. And unlike the key gen, this is deterministic. So if I keep pressing play, you see that this changes. So there is a computation happening in the background, but the output is the same. If I do change this to John uh, uh, Lennon at Beatles.com, you will see that both of this will change. Well, somewhere here they changed. Yeah, all right. If we keep scrolling down, here we have the zero-knowledge proof flow uh, that, uh, I mean, we cannot cover this in detail today. But I'm just going to tell you how it works more or less. So uh, you have a uh, you have several uh, actors uh, that play in this flow. Uh, the most important are the participant and the issuer, and then you have uh, some uh, smart contract that can be run by anybody who is uh, who wants to run the smart contract. So anybody who's on the chain, the the participant will create his credential keeper and generate a credential request. The credential request is going to be sent to the issuer that will sign it. Credential issuer signs the credential request from the participant. So again, I'm just going to show you to you what it looks like cryptographically. Let's clear this. So here I am in the scenario credential. I state that I am Mad Hatter, which is the, the name that uh, Jarmil uh, chose for our credential issuer. And I have my valid issuer key pair, which is this. And I have a credential request inside Alice or from Alice, both will work. And this is the credential request. So look guys, this, this is a pretty complex crypto object. This is the credential keeper. When I create the credential signature, then print the credential signature and print the verifier. This verifier, we don't want to print it now. So I'm just going to write a comment. I'm going to execute this. Here we go. So this is a signed credential. A tilde, B tilde, H. That can be used to, to perform operations on a blockchain. Below, we have the crypto uh, petition flow that we, we are not uh, looking at right now. We don't really care right now. Okay, I showed you uh, the version in incognito because if we compare it with this, we say that we have a couple of buttons more. Actually, if from here, I try to, cl to click on create API, I get this message that I must be logged in to save. And uh, if I want to log in, I obviously have to create an account. And in order to create an account, you need a secret password that I'm gonna write in the chat. Here we go. This is just, just for those of you who want to register this. Okay. So now let's, okay, let's say that we were here. So this was our, this was our uh, key, gen, uh, key generation smart contract. Let's say that, let's pretend that I am pressing this button. In reality, I already have it saved into my contract. So let's look at my contracts. This is what we call the backend. So this is what I would have saved if I pressed create API. No, sorry, wrong button. So this is, yeah. I won't click on edit, I just, I just click on this. 
just to, to show you that this is exactly the same thing that we saw before. It's the same script, okay? And uh, going back again, you, you probably, you know very well by now that some scripts like this one, for example, some scripts, they expect input. So given that I have a string name password is here, given that I have a string name header and message is here. So if I would say, if I would save this script, which is called encrypt a message using, using password, which I already have done actually, I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna show you that the script is here. And it also saved something into keys and into data, all right? So this is stuff that is stored here, but let's first look at generator keeper, this one. If we look at all the way here, you have this link button and look at the bottom left of the screen to see where it points to. Can you see it guys? Okay, I'm gonna click on this link. I'm gonna open it on a new tab, which is this. And what happens is that I have generated a keeper uh, from an API. I'm gonna post this into the chat so that you can try yourself. So if I refresh this, I will get a new keeper. Uh, this runs uh, uh, as a, you know as a, using a get in the browser, but it also it is also a fully fledged REST API, which I can test here by launching a, a an instance of Swagger. How do I test this? I get here, I click on create keeper, then I click on try out. A little bit more, I click on execute. And here I have the result, all right? Not only uh, I have a line to curl, well, I have a curl uh, line to, to test the script uh, as a common line. You see curl minus x post, this thing, minus h accepts uh, content type JSON, minus d data and keys, which is empty, which is basically this thing here. We're not passing anything to it. I'm uh, just for fun, I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna run it on window, in windows, command prompt. I paste it here, I'm gonna run it and I have a keeper. I'm gonna run it again and I have a different keeper. You see, A2PL, PFD0, right? Okay. Uh, so the reason we've done this is, uh, so this was done, uh, th this, this whole uh, backend part is done using restroom MW. The, na the, na the name is very unfortunate but it's the best way we could combine REST with Zenroom, uh, where MW is an extension of a previous piece of code that uh, Puria wrote called Restroom, which basically it does this. It takes a Zen code script and it creates an API of it here. So, so basically when you hit this endpoint, this smart contract is executed on the server. Are you with me, guys? Yep. Okay. To those of you who haven't fallen asleep yet, the next question probably is, this is all cool, but how do I run a smart contract that, uh, that requires data? Good. Let's take this example. Encrypt message with password. So we see that we have something in keys and something in data. But with data, we have this red mark that says what is stored in data will not be passed to the API. Only what is stored in keys will be used. Okay, let's, what does it mean? Let's make a test. Let, let's try to run it as it is now. So I'm just gonna click on the link. And what do I get? I get an error. What is the error is this, given that I have a string name adder. Now, 
this string name header is exactly, let me close this, is exactly what we find inside data. It's here. It, it cannot find it because this stuff is not being passed to it. So how do we, so first of all, why? The reason is that um, uh, we can pass two parameters to Zenroom and we think that one of the parameters is fixed stuff that uh, stays, the same, stays the same for every execution, like uh, Keeper, like a uh, certain data structure that uh, a certain piece of data you will use, uh, and a different part of the, the data you pass is stuff that you want to pass from the API. So it, it comes from the REST, uh, the REST API call that you will, uh, that you will use uh, from your, your application. How do we test this? We go in the Swagger and we look at, and we find the, the script, which is this one, encrypt message with password. Right, actually, okay, we found the script. What, what we have to do is passing it the data that it needs to, to run. So we're gonna open this, copy this data. Now I'm gonna run uh, the script uh, without uh, without passing in the data just for fun, just for you to, to see that the result is the same. So I click on execute. And I am getting the same issue. So this, given that I have a string name header, which is the same thing that I got here as an error. So what do I do now? I paste into this, the data that I have uh, copied one, one second ago. And I go back to run execute, and now everything should magically work. Yes, here we go. In the same fashion, I have a curl line here. So the only difference is, so this is still the same uh, uh, endpoint application.json, content app application.json, minus D, here we have some stuff into data. Not into keys, but into data. So I can copy this and I can execute it once again in my common prompt. Oops, nope. Here we go. I execute it and I get this. Here we go. Something else I can uh, tell you to help you is uh, we have, uh, I mean, passing stuff uh, like, like this in line is nice, but it would be nicer to pass a file to curl, which we have documented here. So it's in the general documentation in the last part of the API room manual, there is uh, an example of how to curl with a file. So basically you need to pass, you, you need to use the parameter minus D, which we are also using here, minus D. But then instead of doing uh, brackets uh, data, you do at uh, path enabled file. Right. Good. So um, we can go on a little bit uh, with the demo and the conversation, but I'm going to stop the recording now, uh, unless you have uh, questions about this part.